Welcome to another awesome episode of the Physio Mission Podcast. I have on today Ray Bardinelli, and I am like so stoked for this interview because Ray and I had just been talking before we actually hit record, and oh my God, the stuff that that you are doing is just it's just insane. Like, first of all, it like it, it really like lights my brain up because I sort of like think about what I do in the physio frameworks as almost like an artificial intelligence. It's a system that sits in your brain that you actually use to make clinical decisions, but you've actually taken a system and you've implanted it into an EMR, into a, a sort of like CMS system, which is, a, as we just talked about, is like a misnomer. But it essentially does what a lot of us are trying to do, but it does it for you which frees you up to do other things. So welcome to the Physio Mission Podcast, man. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to talk to you. I Like I said, been watching you for a while. I'm, I'm excited to be here. Awesome. All right, let's, let's go to the very beginning, which is like, I love to hear the origin story about how you got to the point where you actually got into doing this and why you started it and the whole thing. So like, like I was telling you before, before we hopped on here, it was, this thing was totally, totally selfish. Like it was like, I'm a systems guy. I love systems. Um, I have to figure out inefficiencies in my systems. And one of them was my documentation. Like it was, it was spilling over into my home life. Right. So I was spending an hour, hour and a half a day. And I figured it out. It was an hour and 20 minutes a day when I was timing mm. myself outside of my practice. Cause I refused to do it in front of my patients. Um, so I was spending all that time at home. And then I calculated over 13 years, uh, figuring 40 hours a week. I lost over three years with my children, you know, like I was, I have a 16, 14 year old and a seven year old. Wait a minute. That's over how many years? 13 years. 13 years. So that's like, so, okay. So if we took that over 10 years, that's about 20 something percent of your life essentially. Yeah. 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 Oh, that is scary to think of. So every, so, so for every like year that we're alive two we spent two months documenting. Stop, stop. I'm going to get depressed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead. So what happened next? So then after that, what, what, what happened is, so I started calculating it. And then I, I started begging, like I started going to the EMRs and saying, Hey, listen, you need to make this fix. And I started jumping from one EMR to the other, try this one, try that one, demoing as many of them as I could trying to find something to give me my life back. And mm -hmm. after years of looking, I figured out it's not there. And then about six and a half years ago, I decided, well, if nobody's going to do something about it, I have to. You know, and then I started working on it and then, but then it changed. Like now, now, you know, I talked to other people and talked to them about what they were losing people that lost more than I did. And this whole thing shifted. And now it's about the people and, and really trying to give people their life lives back and making sure that my friends that have lost marriages that have lost so frigging much because they're giving that home life away to do their paperwork it shifted and now now it's it's nothing but removing that like that's my goal in life is to remove that for people so that you can so that you can be a physical therapist you can be good at your job and at the end of the day you can go home and you don't have shit hanging over your head you don't have to worry about all your marketing my emails my sequences my my documentation all the crap that's hanging over your head i want it gone so that's that's the motivation that's the the goal for the whole thing I mean, talk about solving a really big problem. They always say that if you want to do well in business, solve a really big problem. I mean, to, for the people that you've spoken to that have like, you know, lost their family because they don't spend enough time with their wife and kids, that's a really fucking big problem. <laughs> and the fact that you're taking that on, first of all, you know, like, good on to you, man, because like I, you know, I, it, it only in recent years have I even heard about what you're doing. And I wish that I had heard about it when I started my practice so that it could have been there at the beginning. And, you know, I, hopefully when we get off this podcast, we could talk a little bit more about maybe implementing this in my practice because, <laughs> because it sounds like something that is, is really, you know, it's, it's almost like game changing, but it's also life changing for the practitioner. So let's like, let's like get into it. So there's, there's sort of like two pieces of software that we're talking about, right? Self-doc, which is AI EMR, and that stands for artificial intelligence, electronic medical records, if you will. Mm -hmm. And the other one is ATOS, which is essentially a clinic management app. These two things dovetail together, but let's start off with this concept of artificial intelligence in an EMR sounds like, well, what did we go to school for? Like, why, why do I need artificial intelligence? Is, aren't I the, aren't I the intelligence behind all my documentation? What is this thing going to do for me? Right. So we're not trying to replace the therapist or like your clinical judgment or any of that. Most documentation to be performed is CYA. 
you know, we're, we're doing it like this has to be done. We know what we're doing with the patient. Writing it down doesn't prove that. So the goal is to try to learn from you and predict what you want and predict the questions that you would ask, the tests that you would do. So based upon one positive test, it might elicit three or four other that you want to look at because that one's positive. Does um, the software get smarter as you use it? Yes. Yes. And that's you, what that's what AI is all about, right? It's, a, it's it's actually machine learning where it's not a prefabricated cookie cutter approach. It's quite the opposite. It, it adapts to the way you work. Correct. Correct. It'll learn if you add things, if you delete things over time, it's like, hey, you know, it'll it'll start changing your templates for you automatically. So your template starts to dial in on you. So as as you use it, the template changes and becomes more accustomed to the therapist instead wow. of the other way around, the therapist getting used to the template or going and spending hours digging in and removing what they don't want and adding what they do want to these. Or if you go to a new course, then you got to add all this. But yeah, so so it takes that away. The, the AI really kicks in for the assessment, the plan, and the goals. That's, that's where the algorithms start to dig out the information, the largest areas of functional deficit. It takes therapist preference into it. It takes a bunch of data points in and says, okay, this is most likely what you would want. So this, this statement is most likely what you would want. You want to fix the patient's standing tolerance and you know stair climbing ability to allow for improved ambulation at work you know so you know it'll so it'll automatically create that that statement for you and then on the the plan and the goals it digs information out of other places and automatically puts it all together for you and uh your goals are already done. Your your dates for your goals are already done. Your short-term goals, your long-term goals, it's already done. Then not only does it give you like the top 10 goals that it, that it finds, it lists all of them in chronological order based upon the algorithm, what, what it digs out. And you can select them, you can add other ones, you can change them, you can delete them, you know, you can drop them up and down, you know, just with one click. That is crazy. That is crazy. That is what we are doing, but we are spending our man hours doing it. And we do it the same way all the time. If we have a total knee, we're basically doing a lot of the same stuff repeated over and over and over. And so what the EMR is doing is it's essentially like learning from you and then kicking back and then automating the processes that you would normally then do. Correct. Correct. So it's starting. Okay. okay these are the goals you typically select. You've moved this goal up a bunch of times. Okay put that goal up there automatically. Now, normally we think of like EMR and a marketing system as two separate entities, right? Like we, we buy an EMR and then eventually if you're a practice owner, you get to the point where you're like, fuck, I should probably do some marketing, right? And then you like, you go try to learn marketing stuff and then you go and buy some sort of marketing platform or you, you invest in learning and then you invest in click funnels, then you invest, then you need some sort of like, you know, then MailChimp or Constant Contact or something to send out your emails. And then you go and you get like, okay, maybe I need to do some Facebook stuff. So I'll get many chat. And like, you start trying to piecemeal all of these different like puzzle pieces together. And then you realize they don't talk to each other. So then you get Zapier, which makes all these things talk to each other. And eventually you have such a tech headache that you need like, you know, you need to go on migraine meds or something because you just, you can't think straight. And then, then your zaps aren't working. Right. And you can't figure out where it's going wrong. And this person yep. didn't come off the list. They're still getting the stuff. This person yep. is supposed to be on the list. They're not on the list. Right. You know, it's a monster. Like it's a monster to manage. Like, you know, spending all of that time, you know, was uh, extra hours in a week that I didn't want to spend because well, I want, want to do other stuff. <laughs> and what you've done sort of solves that. Yes. Yes. So, so the, the marketing and it does like uh, there, Okay, I'm gonna go on my soapbox here for one minute. Um, your your CRMs. So for people that don't know, your customer relationship management systems, uh, Infusionsoft or Keep, whatever they're calling it this week, uh, Mailchimp, Constant Talk, Contact, Active Campaign, all, all of these things that right they send emails, they send generic emails to people, right? They don't really manage the relationship. Your therapist has no idea what email just got sent to the person. And the email's generic, and the person your open rates are thirty percent if you're lucky. If you're lucky, yep. So, so, and, and I did this in my practice for years, and it, it just wasn't working for me. I'm like, we've we've got to improve this. So then, what we did is we start digging the patient's goals out, right? So we get their goals on the first phone call. 
and then their goals are starting to be peppered throughout the email. So, and our- is the, let me ask you a question. Is the, is the front desk person on the first phone call also interfacing with the software? Yes. As they're on the first, and actually we take over your first phone call. Like, so we take over your phones. So whenever the phone rings, if it's a past patient or a current patient, it brings up all their data automatically. As soon as the phone rings, as soon as you click, I got it, bang, it brings up all their data. So their goals- I think you just, I think you just said, as soon as the phone rings, yeah, it brings yeah, that, up all the patient data. Right, right. <laughs> so if you're okay, logged in- That's awesome. If you're logged into your system, the phone rings, you get the phone call thing up in the corner, you click it, it tells you, yeah, we're putting in now the the- the visits that are scheduled. How many visits a week are they supposed to be coming? What are their goals from therapy? Uh, you know, what are they coming for? Who are they seeing? So like instantly when the phone rings, you know everything about that patient. You can see notes on them. It all just pops up automatically. Mm. So then from there, we we collect that data, their goals, you know, they, you know, all this data is input. Then all of that data then dumps into the EMR, right? So now when the therapist sees the patient, the patient's not asked to repeat themselves. Mm. They're saying, hey, I talked to Tammy up front and and she said that you, you're you having problems with this, this. this. Is that correct? So, yeah. You know what's funny? We we try to we have tried to solve all of this stuff in our practice, but we do it the we do it the hard way. Is the front desk will take all this stuff, put it into an Excel spreadsheet or some sort of template. Then that that gets printed onto a piece of paper, and then when I do, let's say uh, uh, we call it FPA free pain assessment, or I do a first session or whatever, I get the piece of paper. It has the information on there. I then read it back to the person. I then take notes about what's going on. Those notes then have to get typed up by somebody that goes back into the EM. Are, then the therapist who's seeing them for the first time needs to go in and read all of those notes and then basically get additional information. That's right. the fucking long way. <laughs> and I did it. I did it. Like, uh, the, honestly, this is, this is how this thing was born. Like that. Yep. I did that. I did that. It worked. It worked. It was just things would get missed. People would, you know, we're human. We, we, you know, so what this does is it dumps all that information in the subjective portion of the notes are all done by the patient at home before they ever get to the thing before they ever come and show up for the first visit. So all their information's in there. So whenever they go to fill out their paperwork, their paperwork's already partially filled out by what the front desk did. Right. So they're just confirming that information. They go through the subjective, which as I was telling before, is smart. Like it's going to dial in on the person. It's not a generic, here's your template. It's the same for every shoulder patient. Right. You know? So you're not taking the subjective with the patient in the clinic. The patient is filling out their quote unquote subjective at home and then you are clarifying or expounding on that in the interview. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because honestly, like you like it's a documentation CYA, right? We want to cover our butt. We want to make sure that we have everything there necessary to get paid. So this is going to dial you in pretty stinking close. If you have some specific questions that are outside of that, you, you may or may not document those because you may think that it's very, very important information or it's something right. that, I need to know, but maybe I don't need to share it. How does this work with a complex patient? Somebody comes in, I had a patient last week. I mean, here's the report, right? The side of my face is numb. My ear hurts. I have lip pain and nose pain. I get unilateral headaches. I get pain into my trap. My right hip hurts. My low back hurts. And I got something wrong with my knee. Right. I don't so, have, I don't, I don't have MS. And uh, can you help me? You know, like there, we, every now and then we get those unicorns that come in and we're like, okay, first of all, I don't, you need like a, a miracle worker, not me. But you know, that being said, like, right. The, can, can it can it deal with that? No and yes. Right okay. now, no. In the long term, yes. We're working on this massive uh, AI driven, you know, selection driven template that that blends. So so right now it's template driven. Neck, back, shoulder, hip, elbow, knee, you know, whatever. So it goes. Yeah. They're all template driven. You can select two of those templates. Um, but then we're starting to work on a master one that will it was for these complex patients it lets them answer it's my face that hurts then it then it starts to dial in on the face stuff right do you have any other problems select all that apply my face my shoulder my my upper back my hip my left hip my right knee and then then it puts all of those templates and it get get allows you to select. So the more you select, the more it dials in. How so is this thing's getting more robust over time? Correct. Correct. It's and, not. Gonna, and this is what you're doing full time. I mean, this is like, this is your baby. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I sold my practice in January and yeah, this is it. Let's change gears a little bit. Let's be done with the EMR stuff, but then we're, we're going to come back to it because all of these problems that we're trying to solve in our business, I know that your your software is attempting to solve. And when I looked at some of your content and you know, you're know you doing this in such a smart way where you're really talking a lot about the problems that physical therapists face. Oh, and by the way, I happen to sell this piece of software that solves that problem, which is like the smartest way to really market because... It's really, it's really talking to what it is that we are struggling with. It's very difficult to sell like a product, but it's really easy to talk about people's issues and then slot a product in. So I want to talk about some of the issues because you've also done a ton of self-development in this area to understand those problems and to understand really what physical therapists are facing in the clinic. And I want to start with patient experience and understanding, first of all, what is that really? Because we hear that term thrown around a lot, patient experience. What does it really mean? And then um, what is your perspective on it in terms of what it means to solve that, I don't say solve the patient experience problem, but to optimize the patient experience? Right, right. So this is going to be different for everybody, right? So, so the, but there are certain things that you want to do. There are certain things, you know, you want to be in contact with your patient. You want to be reaching out to them outside of business hours when they're not expecting it, right? So I'm working on this book, Jeremy Sutton's helped me, we're, we're doing this book. In it, one of the chapters that I'm, I'm working on literally right now is on specifically this. So, so this chapter is basically on the patient experience. So patients have expectations, right? So you need to set your expectation. Once you set that, that expectation is either set by you or it's set externally, right? So, right. so you know, I'm expecting I go to physical therapy, this is kind of how I'm expecting this to go, right? So you either set the expectation or the expectation is set or by an external factor. Right? It's very interesting that you said that and you're writing that chapter in your book because I actually have a chapter in my book about preframing and how to do that and that your patient's either going to walk in with their own preframe about you and how well can you influence or control the preframe before they come in so that their expectations are managed up front. So it's very interesting. I'm, I'm really interested to read the chapter that's in your book and to see what I got and see how similar and like what other ideas that, you know, that you've got, you know, so I'm so, okay, yeah. keep going. We're on the right track here. You can underwhelm them. You can meet their expectation. You can exceed their expectation. You can delight them. So with the, the acronym is summed. If you, if you underwhelm them, your your net promoter, how likely to refer a family or a friend on a scale zero to ten, right? They're going to be very low. They're going to be a six or below. If you under for those that didn't catch that, what what uh, what Ray's talking about is the net promoter score. Can you repeat again what that actual what the phrase is that you would ask the patient to get a net promoter score? Right. So a guy from Harvard did research on this for years. Uh, it's how likely are you to refer a family or friend to us on a scale of zero to ten? And you right? ask this question. At what point in the patient experience? Uh, the third visit, because the highest point is the fourth visit. So the highest point of drop off is number four. Yes. Yes. Okay. So you ask it on number three because you want to identify that, you know, it just in the nick of time, if you will. Yes. Yes. So that we can hopefully recoup some of those patients that we're about to lose that we don't even know we're about to lose. Right. So if you can recoup those, you know, naturally you're going to make more money. But then uh, if they give you a six or below, they're about to drop off, right? Seven or eight, they're 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 neutral on you. They're going to use you, but they're not going to run around telling everybody about you. Uh, a nine or a ten, these people absolutely love you. They want to tell other people about you, mm -hmm. right? So you want these people to never forget you. The nines are the tens, and the sixes are below. You want them to forget you as soon as possible. You want if, them to forget you as soon as possible. Correct, correct, because they're a detractor. Like this guy's research, right, these right, right. People talk bad about you. Like they'll talk bad How about do you. you Okay, let's go there first. How how would you go about getting somebody, if you're on the third visit, how likely are you to refer me to a friend or family member? The answer is four. That person doesn't drop off. They stay on your schedule. What if they're a detractor? What do you what do you do? So so then then there's a number of things. Number one, if they're a detractor, number one, we're trying to move them. So we have a conversation. We go in the room with them and say, hey, you know we review all of our, what you think is important to us to that end. We always check our reviews. And I looked and I saw you gave us a four. Sure. You know, I'm wondering what we've done that, that isn't working for you. Like, you know, we, we gain some other information if they're improving, like on this thing, we, are you improving, slightly improving, not improving? Uh, how happy are they with the, 
with their with the clinical staff, how happy are they with the front office? It kind of dials us in a little bit, gives us a little more information walking into the room. Sure, to get the why. Yeah, then the therapist says, okay, so we find out. Then, then what we do is we try to correct that. Then subsequently later, we're going to test them again mm. at the end. So we're going to recategorize them. So if at the end they're giving you a, a six or below, you don't market to them. You don't send them crap. Because, uh, perfect example, right? I got a, this insurance company had a nightmare with them, right? When I sold my practice, right? So I'm getting letters from them for cancellations, all this stuff. I asked them three times to send me the stuff. They never did. So I'm, I get this stuff in the mail. Then I get an ad from their company. That <laughs> prompts me to tell my staff, don't ever frigging use this company. They are the biggest hunk of crap ever they have nothing together so i told like four or five people how horrible this company was because they sent me an advertisement uh, very interesting that's true right because i i know i i definitely feel that way when i'm advertised to by people that i did not have a good experience with if i went to a hotel and i hated it and now i'm getting emails from that hotel not only do i like put that in the spam folder i, I make a mental note like <laughs> to, ever, if, if, if it ever comes up again, you know, like fuck these people, ever, like, you know, don't ever go there. Yeah. 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 But, but you want those people to forget you, you know? Right. So, so the sooner they forget you, the better. So advertising to these people is actually counterproductive. It's actually going to harm your business. You're going right. to lose money by advertising to them. So not these are, these are not just like things that your EMR is doing. These are principles. So if you're, if you're out there and you own a practice or you have a cash based practice, you know, this is something that people, even if they're not going to switch to your EMR, which would do, which would obviously integrate this into the entire, uh, te technological process. People can go out and do this right now. They can start asking that question on visit four, get a number between zero and 10. If that number is eight, nine or 10, then that person is a, is a promoter. If that number is six or below, that person is a detractor. And if they're in the middle, then they can, they're on the fence, right? They can go either way. And then if they're six or below, start having a conversation with them to find out the why. In other words, what is the reason that you selected this number and what can we do to, uh, to make your experience better? Correct. And then, then uh, I, so I have a free app for that. My, my, I have eight NPS, uh, you know, it's a free app that I give out for okay. that. That, that you can use that on third visit and it'll also get you Google reviews. The nine or tens, my software automatically does it. This, they're actually gonna have to put in their email and then it'll email them and then you walk into the room when, when you're face to face and you ask them if they would take 30 seconds to give you a Google review. You know, do you have your phone? Yes, do you get email on your phone? Yes. Uh, hey, would you mind taking 30 seconds? They gave you a nine or 10, they love you. Yeah, they'll, they'll take it. And so now you're getting Google reviews, your SEO is improving. Right. But yeah, that, that's free. It's automatically built into mine, but if people want it, yeah, it is NPS free is uh, out there. That's awesome. So uh, we're talking about the patient experience. So you're, you're getting them in the door. We talked a little bit about like the importance of the first phone call, getting all that information on the first phone call so they get customized emails. Now the person starts, you get to the third visit, you're asking them for their net promoter score and you're, you're sort of like categorizing those people as either detractors, they need work, or you're taking somebody who's had a great experience. What do you do with the people that are in the middle, that are on the fence? Uh, the people that, that are in the middle, like when we, well, we just basically use it for advertising, right? We're not, we're not going to push you. Uh, so, so if you ask them for the, ref, for the referral and they gave you a seven or eight, your subsequent net promoter score is going to drop. Um, so we don't ask them for the referral. We will ask them to come back. We will talk to them about changes, improvements that we're making to mm. try to, to show them that, that we are trying to improve our practice. We are trying to improve our processes, you know, hopefully move that subsequent net promoter score up to a place where they're actually useful to your practice. Is this the key to, to minimizing drop-offs? Yeah. Yes. There, there's a number of things like the, the whole experience has to be there. You know, like that, everything you're advertising, your first phone call, your the whole system has to be there. This is a tool. It's one more tool in the toolbox. This tool is meant to identify your high dropbox. It's meant to identify the people that are about to go away. Mm. So, so yeah, it's one piece in that in that puzzle. Um, probably the most useful piece because it gives you data and feedback it's your measurement tool um the all of the other stuff you that you're doing uh 
it is just more part of the process, more part of the system, then you'll see them reflecting in different ways. Your eval no-show rate will drop. Your cancellation no-show rate will drop. Those things will affect different places. But this toll will measure and tell you, yeah, this, you've got a problem with this person. Right. So let's let's talk about getting more patients in the door. Um, I know that you are a huge fan of word of mouth marketing. And it's funny because I was driving in my car the other day and I was thinking about what, you know, I sometimes do put solo podcasts as opposed to interviews. Like, what can I talk about? What, what would be valuable? And I think that there's a lot of buzz out there about Facebook, Facebook advertising, Facebook marketing, YouTube advertising, marketing. People feel like they're inadequate because they don't know how to do Facebook. And they're like, oh my God, I should hire somebody to teach me how to do Facebook. Maybe I should take a course. Oh, maybe I should learn how to do this or run my own ads. But the reality is like when I started my practice, it was 100% word of mouth and we built very, very, very quickly. And it's still the majority of what we do is word of mouth. I don't run Facebook ads for my brick and mortar practice. I only run them for physio secrets. And I, I do a, a little bit of advertising on, on uh, Google AdWords, but that's basically it. The majority of what we do is word of mouth to this day. And I want, I want to talk a little bit about that and how important it is Word of mouth advertising, how do you leverage it? How do you optimize it? How do you systematize it? All those things. And what, what's worked for you? So, well, word of mouth advertising is, well, okay. So a little bit on the statistics. So I'm like everybody else. I just want to grow my practice, right? I, I wanted to be as successful as I could. But yet again, I'm a, I'm a systems guy. I have to figure out where my biggest leverage point is. Where can I get the most bang for my buck? Where can I bring the most money into my practice? I don't want to do this. I want to do this efficiently. So, so I looked and say I found 80% of my people were word of mouth. So 20%. So if I try to grow this 20% and I do it great, I double my new, my new people off the street. I've had a 10% growth in my business. There's a stat in, in the market and most people in the therapy field don't know, but everybody else that's marketing knows this 80% of your future customers come from 20% of your current and past patients. It's like Pareto's rule a little bit. Yeah. If you can make that 20% grow by 2%, what does that do to that 80% pie? Mm. Grow by 10%. So you get 8% by 2% improvement by getting 2% more people to talk about. What's the number one thing that I can do in my practice to increase that 20% and get those people to refer more people contact reach out to them make them think you care it's it's that same thing that we were talking about you you know the the uh the set expectations underwhelm me uh exceed delight if you delight somebody if you delight them they're going to refer to you they're going to refer to you but you can't do it by meeting or even just exceeding their expectation, you have to absolutely delight them. You have to wow them. Exactly. Then they won't shut the hell up. Yeah. <laughs> so, what about people that have like they've 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 gone by the wayside? You haven't seen them in a while. Uh, you know, it's been six months. It's been a year. I, you know, the idea of communicating or reaching out to them. But what does that actually look like? Is it a phone call? Is it an email? What are you saying in the email? Like, what is? What is the tone of that? I mean, it's almost awkward. It's almost like reaching out to a friend you haven't seen in a long time. And you almost feel embarrassed because you really should have been keeping contact with them this whole time, but you didn't. And it's like, what do you say? It's like, hey, bud, how you doing? You know, like, what do you say to a past patient who you haven't seen in a while so that they don't think that you're just reaching out to kind of say, hey, got any new injuries? So you can come over here and I can help you. Yeah, so, so the key is to never let the relationship end. Okay. So, so if you continually market to them, if you drip to them, if you're sending them texts and emails. Drip, by the way, means to send them an email every now and then, like to drip them emails. Right? Email, text, some, something, something, um, reaching out to them. See, now we have different sequences that we have built into ours, like if somebody's likely to return. So like if somebody's got a chronic injury or they're likely to return, at three months, we're going to start working that person hard. We're going to start, you know, Hey, one, you know, they're going to get that ringless call to voicemail. Hey, I just want to, it's been about three months and I, I just wanted to personally reach out to you and, and make sure you're okay. And that everything's going well with your back. Um, you know, Hey, if, if you're having any issues or any problems of any kind, or maybe you've got a friend or family member that might benefit from what we do too. Um, hey, 
it would be great to see you. I'm going to offer you a free consultation visit. If you feel that that's necessary, please just give me a call. So, so then you record that one time and it goes out to everybody with a back problem. Wow. Right? You can do the same thing for everybody with a knee problem, everybody with a shoulder problem. Yeah, for those that are listening that are not 100% following this because they haven't gone deep into marketing and understand what you're talking about. No, it's okay. I'm just going to, I'm going to summarize it. I'm going to put it in sort of like simple terms. So a direct to voicemail um, message is where your phone rings, but rather than you being able to answer the phone, the message... It, oh, doesn't. it doesn't ring. No, it just shows okay, up. Okay. Oh, oh it's just right. It just shows up as, as, as like you have a message right, right on your phone and it's, it's a recording of the, 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 the sorry, you, the therapist, right. Um, that you just sort of like outline for us what you might say on that thing, but you can send that to a hundred patients at once. You don't have to do this one at a time. Yeah. With one click. And then you do sequences that's followed up by text message and the text message, you refer the fact that you called them. Hey, I tried to reach out to you, but missed you. You know, mm. so, so then, or I tried to call you, but I didn't get a hold of you. And then you talk about the same thing that you wanted to talk about again. Hey, I hope you're doing well. We're doing our, you know, free consultation visits over the next two weeks. If you want one of those, there's only 10 left. So we created urgency. And, you know, so right. we have this whole thing. It's all built up. So, so it does that. But the, the key thing is staying in contact with these people. Like, don't let them drop off. Don't let them cool down. The nines or the tens, you want them to never forget you. So, so you've got to constantly reach out to them and and don't do the BS emails. Like, okay, so we did a bunch of research and there's a bunch of research outside of mine out there that you can go look at. And if you are sending people BS emails, your open rates with that person go. What's what's considered a BS email? Uh, just a, a generic email, like uh, like five pages long, that. This person knows that Jared didn't sit down and type this out to me. Mm. Jared's sending this to a thousand people. But if I say, you know, hey, hey Jared, how's your back? How are you, how are you doing? Are you still able to keep exercising and getting up and down with the kids or whatever it might be? You know, so, so then now it's not BS. And then in the clinic, when you get the notification on the app saying, hey, they got this email, you get them in the habit of opening your emails because you ask, hey, did you get my email? Uh, no, I sent them. You might want to check those because I send you some important, some really important stuff in there. So make sure you check them from us. They, they're, they're not just junk. Right. So then the next time we ask them, hey, did you get my email? After a while, these people start opening your emails because they're afraid to look you in the face and say, no, I don't. Right. <laughs> Right. I mean, that's, this is what I mean, man. It's like you looked at all the problems that we were having because you yourself were having those very same problems in your business. And you said, how can I solve this in a way that frees up the most valuable commodity we all have, which is our time. And I think that's God, I, I, I can't wait to take a look at the software, like on the back end and just actually see how it actually functions and works and see it, man. Um, yes. I want I want to change gears just a little bit again. Um, cause we could, we could talk about this stuff all day. Cause I know it's super interesting to me, but I, I also like to sort of understand um, a little more personally how people that do successful things get successful things done. And for you, you've, you've essentially, you built a business, you sold that business, you built an EMR system. In fact, you built two, essentially two apps, you run a Facebook group. Let's talk about how it is, like what enables you to be successful in the industry that you're in and do all the stuff that you're doing um, what is, what is your secret sauce? I wish there was man. Like it, it, it's, it's passion. Like it, I've been at this for six and a half years, like just now launching. Um, I've put my family's entire life and future well being into this, my kids, college money, like everything it, it's, mm. it's all been dumped into this. Wow. It's passion. Like, and, and you can't, you can't fake it and you can't teach it. I, w I wish there was, I wish there was some way, but you have to find the thing that moves you. And when you find that thing that moves you, that thing that just, m that makes your, your world spin, then you have to go all in. Like you have to dump everything that you're doing because your happiest life, your best life is on the other end of that. And nothing can deter you when you find your passion, nothing will stop you from achieving the goal. You know, uh, Henry Ford, uh, you know, uh, most people know he, he failed three times 
He went bankrupt three times with a car company. If you had to pick somebody through all history to run a car company for you, it probably, <laughs> it probably wouldn't pick Henry Ford, right? right. Until, so, he, until he won. So, yeah, yeah. So, but he was so passionate about it. The failure didn't even register. It didn't, it didn't matter. It was, it was, it was learning. It was learning. I learned something, you know, Thomas Edison with light bulb fell 10,000 times. Are you kidding me? Like at what point do you give up? Most people give up, but if you're passionate about it, if it matters to you, if it consumes you, if you wake up at three or four in the morning and you're thinking about it and you lay your head down at night and you're trying to shut it off because you just love it that much, man, you need to push into that. You need to find that thing. You need to push into that. You need to go all in, abandon all else and go in because uh, I'm going to get just bear with me here for one second. I'm, I'm religious. If you're not, I don't mean to offend you, but I believe that God has given us each a unique gift, a unique talent that is specific just to us Mm. and that you have something inside of you that you are the best in the world at. There's something in there that no one else in this world can do as good as you. Your life's goal should be to find that and to lean into it. Because once you do, you'll, you'll love it. Like you can't, and you just can't stop it. It's the most fulfilling professional thing I've ever done. Uh, you know, actually my family is, is everything, but professionally I've never done anything that fulfills me the way doing the things that I'm doing fulfill me. So I hate to say that, that you know, it's, it, that there's no secret sauce. It, it's just your, it's just your passion. If you're not passionate about it, you can't fake it. You can't, you know, there's, there's no way to make yourself passionate about something, have a drive for something. How do you manage the, uh, how do you manage the risk both mentally and emotionally of going all in? I don't look at it. <laughs> right. This is, it's not, Interesting. I, I guess you're going to, I'm, I'm, I'm a Henry Ford fan. So uh, this is another quote from him. He said, obstacles are those dreadful things that you see when you take your eyes off your goals. Oh, I love that. So, so I don't see them. I don't look at them. I don't dare look at them. Like, you know, cause if you look like, who the hell am I? Who am I? I'm Ray Brodnelli, some podunk therapist from podunk middle of nowhere, Pennsylvania with no discernible skills for, for software. You know, I, I don't know the first thing about it. I can't, I can't do a JavaScript, you know, but, but there, there was just something that was in me that I was just so passionate about this thing. I, I, I hated it first off that it started out of hate. And then, then, then it was like all in. And then once I started, well, you hated, you hated what at first? My life document, oh. <laughs> documenting, trying to, run, trying to run my practice and, and have my life and spend time with my family and be able to spend that meaningful time. And every time I pushed into my business hard, and then I started becoming more successful in my business. It sucked more of my time. Mm. The more successful I became, the more of my time it sucked. And then I hired people and I got a little break and then we grew more and it sucked more of my time. So it was just, it was, it was like a slippery slope. Every time I pushed into it, it pushed back against me. Right. And every time, every time we would grow, the growth would fall eventually to me. You know, and then I, then I had to do more and more and more. So I started saying, I don't, I don't want to do this. I, I want to automate this process. You know, I don't want to have to have all of these meetings with everyone. Hey, why, why wasn't this email sent? What's going on? Why, why aren't these people on this list? And then I'm tracking down the therapist and giving them, no, now I don't have to do that. It's done. It's yeah. Not much anymore. It's I mean, interesting what you said about the more you pushed into the business, the more it pushed back and the more you, more you put into it, the harder it got and the more it sucked. Because I, I think that there's a lot of um, therapists out there, especially therapists that listen to this podcast and, and listen to your podcast, that may be interested in opening up their own practice, not realizing that you can create it in a way that it produces freedom in your life. But just by creating it, creating it, it doesn't by default produce freedom in your life. And in fact, the opposite is true, is that, you know, when you create it, it, it actually, the more you put into it and the larger it gets, um, the more it demands of you, both mentally, emotionally, physically, and it takes more of your time and, and, and energy. And so 
whatever you're putting your mind into and, and your passion into. And actually, the next episode I'm shooting is going to be called The North Star, which is, which is all about understanding what it is that you want for your life and building a business around that. And I think that we tend to get into business thinking, what kind of business can I build? How do I make my business better? And the emphasis is on your business rather than thinking, what do I want for my life? And then how do I build a business that supports my life? Correct. And, and, and that happened to me. And, that, you know, like to me, the answer to the question is like systems. Like if you enjoy what you're doing, systems is the only way you're going to get your freedom. You know, like Chipotle. Right. I keep using this example. Chipotle. There's Chipotle in my local little city here. Right. I'll guarantee you the guy who owns Chipotle has never set foot in that store. <laughs> Not several people have probably ever put one foot in that store. They probably make a million dollars or more a year out of the place. But they've never set one foot in the store. Right? Why? How can they do that? How is it not consuming them? It's systems. It's because they Chipotle is nothing but a system. That's all it is. It's all McDonald's is. They're just systems. They're systems that are dialed in that they have figured out. They, you know, do you think Chipotle has key employees? Right. You know. <laughs> no, you can't. You can ask for a manager when you go in there, and the person that comes and talks to you just looks like they got off the line. It's like I there know. is no because they yeah. did. It doesn't matter. There's there. You know, Chipotle doesn't care if somebody quits. There's no key. Yeah. Employees. yeah. The system is the key employee. You know. So so and then I realized this. So, oh, so right. well, I, say that again. You said the system. I'm writing this down. I love this. Is the key employee, which is really interesting. I never I never really thought about the concept that your system actually behaves like a member of your team making decisions much like a member of your team does, but the system is doing it for you. Correct. Correct. And then, then, then everything becomes plug and play. Like, so this, this is what I didn't figure out until really late in my practice, you know, that, that, you know, there, your evaluation, not just what are you gaining? You should be getting other crap outside of just, you know, therapy stuff. I should know something about the other person. I should know what my people are getting from that other person. These are the three pieces of information I want you to gain outside of physical therapy and information. Then these three pieces of information, they are going to go here to this person. This person is going to do this with these three pieces of information, right? Then before the next visit, this person is going to collect all of this stuff. Then this person is going to get it ready. So this system is in place. So then it doesn't matter who it is because everything is documented and down. Mm. You can plug anybody in there. It's irrelevant, right? So so one in the email, right? I don't know if you ever read that book, Michael Greber. So in it, he he's talking about the franchise model. And he says, the goal of the franchise model is so that you can put the least skilled person possible in this position and it will work exactly the same, right? So so I'm not suggesting this, but you should be able to put the crappiest therapist possible into your system, and you should be able to get the same result out the back end. That's mm. how you know you own a system. Mm. It's almost like thinking about it, like to think, even if you have no intention of ever franchising, if you think about your business and say, if I were to try to franchise this business, what system would I need to put in place that I could put anybody plug and play in there? I think that's a really interesting way to think about your business. Um, even I think it's very important that people understand that this is what you should be doing even if your business is very small. Even if you're a solo practitioner, you should still have systems documented for everything that you do. But I think that, that generating systems is very good, yeah. That's the best time. Like that is the best time. That's when you have the most control and you understand the system the best is when you're actually doing it. Like if I'm going to go to my front office and tell them how to do billing, something I haven't done in 10 years, mm. no more, 13 years. I, and I'm going to tell them how exactly to run the billing and how to do all of this stuff perfectly. I need to understand how it's supposed to work perfectly, right? The best time to do that is when you're actually doing it. When you're, when you're actually familiar with the topic, right. this, is, this is why I'll never quit treating, right? I'm going to open my own small, teeny tiny practice and treat patients because I believe it's the only way that my software can continue to get better because I have to feel the problems, I, right? So it's the same thing. I can't tell you how billing should work best if I'm not doing billing. I can't tell you how physical therapy documentation should work best if I'm not doing it. Right. Very interesting. So I have the same philosophy is that I still treat a day and a half a week. And I, I don't need to be treating, but I do it because if I don't keep my hands dirty, 
then I sort of like, how do I teach this stuff if I don't actually know what's, you know, if, and it's very interesting that, that, that you say that, the, that we, don't, we tend not to think about these things until later on when we really need them, but that's not the time to think about them. The time to think about them and document them is when you're actually in the very, very beginning stages physically doing them so that you can build the systems and just hand it on to somebody else. And I feel like I wish someone had told me that when I started my practice because I would have started to build this shit way earlier. Right, and, and I, and I would have got my freedom way earlier. Like my freedom wouldn't have been as far down the road. I wouldn't have had that. I grew and pushed back against me. It, it, it consumed more of my time and I grew more to try to get more freedom and to push back against me harder. Yeah. So yeah, if somebody had told me, I, I would I would have started at the beginning and I would have said, okay, this is all a system. This thing should be nothing but a system. I should be able to remove myself tomorrow and it should run exactly the same. For the physios that are listening right now who are intimidated about the concept of starting their own system, I am so thankful that they listen to this podcast all the way to the end or watch the video because you're actually offering literally a solution to the system's problem. The problem being, how do I generate the system from scratch? But your EMR essentially is the plug and play system that yeah. does that. So how do people learn more about um, the EMR that you've created, uh, ATOS and self-doc? Um, how do they, how do they learn more about it? How do they, how do they get a sample? How do they, and then once they do, how do they, if they're already using an EMR, can they, can they switch EMRs and how do they get all the information migrated over? And I'm asking personally for my own business, <laughs> I want this answer. <laughs> and then if I know, if I want the answer, someone else does too. Yeah. So, so the long and the short of it is we can move some of the information, but we can't move all the information. Um, the problem is it requires an API integration, right? So say you want to switch from WebPT, clinician, their office, whoever, whoever, say you want to switch. They're not going to be like, oh yeah, you want to switch. Hey, yeah, let me send all of your information over to them for you. Make this as easy as possible for you to leave us and to go to this company. So basically we, we can pull down the demographic information, all of that data and bring all of that data in. Uh, the notes and everything, there's no way that we can pull all that in. Like people have to do a quick eval. For, fortunately for them, our eval right. very This quick. stuff can get exported as PDFs and then uploaded into your software, right? So it can, it can live in your software. You just can't have the actual data there. Correct, correct. So yeah. like, yeah, but if you want to load the eval, our evals take three to five minutes to document. So, so it, it doesn't take long, or even if you're doing a quick mm. eval, people, you know, you know, you'll have probably about what you have on a standard day's visit do worth of paperwork just right. to do evals on everybody for one day. Oh, that's yeah. crazy. And how do people demo it? How do they find out more about it or where do they go? Yeah, you can go to selfdoc, S-E-L-F-D-O-C, A-I-M-R.com. And, or you can go to adisapp.com. Um, we'll put those in the show notes as well. Self-doc, if you have self-doc, you get ATIS. Um, ATIS is also a standalone product, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure why you'd want to do it. Um, you know, you can remove the double data entry with, you know, because unfortunately, again, uh, WebPT doesn't want to play with my other, with ATIS because, you know, they don't, it's competition for them. They don't want to right. make you, they want to make it difficult. Um, so yeah. And I know some of the questions that people are going to ask is, is it, is it compliant? Does it follow Medicare guidelines? Does it stay up to date with all that stuff? Yes. Yes. We, we are not up on MIPS yet. We're working on getting our MIPS up and running. Um, MIPS is god awful and horrible and it's a trash bag and I hate it because I think the goal of it is to force people into using products like mine, which is BS. Mm. I want you to use my product because it's awesome. Not because they're, they're, Medicare is pushing it, but that's a whole different story. But yes, we're not up on MIPS yet. We're going to be up on MIPS uh, here soon. But again, my, my goal is not to just create some generic thing that, oh, hey, you fill out these boxes and you're you're good with MIPS. My goal is to do it for you. Mm. So you don't have to do it. Like, right, you're taking a very different approach to solving a problem, kind of like Tesla took to the car. It's just, it's a it's a different thing. Yes, exactly, exactly, and and like you know, like or, or value, evaluation complexity. We automatically fill out your evaluation complexity for you. Like we we data mine all the patient's information. We try to put them in the highest category possible. You can change it, but we try to do the crap work that really doesn't improve the patient care at all. You know, 
automatically for you to give you the time to work on the things that are important, the people that are important and spend that additional time with your family and friends or doing things that you love. That's awesome. Ray, God, I keep talking about this stuff, but we should probably close up. I, I, I want to I let everybody know they should go to the, the Physical Therapy Business Builder uh, Facebook group and join up uh, to learn more and you know engage in the conversation about uh, how to build your practice um, that you have over there going with Jerry Durham, who is another amazing marketer and front desk patient experience person. Make sure if you haven't watched already, uh, make sure to watch the video I did with, uh, with Jerry and listen to the podcast I did with him because there's some amazing information there. It's one of the first podcasts I did. Um, and also I was on Jerry's podcast, which he's launching soon. So make sure to uh, make sure to get that as well. Um, Ray, thank you so much for being on the Physical Mission Podcast, man. I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me, man. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. 